All right, good night again, everyone. It's been about a week. I do no live study, especially on this issue, as I had promised to touch up on this Sabbath issue and give as much information on it as possible, as well as to take it from various angles. So those of you who will be joining me, joining me tonight for this live study, I'm very happy to have you. And I know for most of you, this has been a wonderful series. I know you have been learning a lot, a lot of things perhaps was um, were reinforced and you are getting a better grasp of the issues regarding um, Sabbatarianism as well as you know the, the arguments for and against. And at the end of the day, whatever decision you make, it's based on you and I do hope that it's an intelligent one where you realize that Sabbath keeping is not something that is salvific. It's not something that you must do in order to be saved or to maintain your salvation status. But it's just one of those practices or rituals, ceremonies that you may choose to do or not to do as a new covenant believer. So this evening, I'm going to demonstrate that Romans 14 and Colossians chapter 2 destroy mandatory Sabbath keeping. Romans 14 and Colossians 2 destroy mandatory Sabbath keeping. For those of you who may be watching for the first time or you know just joining, you can go on YouTube. I have uploaded the previous studies that I've done. So you can go on YouTube, type up my name and look them up and you'll be able to see them. Now, also, um, those of you who don't know about my book, uh, All Foods Are Clean and Every Day is the Sabbath. You can get it on ratslav.com. The links are on my page and um, a few other sites. You can even, um, when you check a few YouTube videos, you should be able to see the link there. So make good use of it. Um, this here, extensively deals with Romans 14 because the whole uh, book really focuses on um, it's a response to Dr. Samuel Bakioki and the Seventh-day Adventist Church on the foods issue and uh, Sabbath keeping from Romans chapter 14 so I've dealt extensively with Romans 14 in the book as well as um, Colossians chapter 2 too but I'm just going to um, give you you know some of the arguments in a nutshell to show you how they completely destroy it but if you want an extensive view of it you could just uh get my book read it hit me up i'll be happy to connect you with it now and and when i was writing this because you know um as a, a protocol of polemics is that your your opponents and those who are of a different view must see what you're doing and to see if your arguments are in line with you know exegesis and as well as if you're properly representing their arguments so for example in my book i'm arguing against um adventism on these issues i followed the protocol and i sent um the rough draft to uh the adventist seminaries in the united states as well as ncu here northern caribbean university and the relevant parties involved now none have responded except for one adventist professor so the Adventist theologians of Northern Caribbean University here in Jamaica are Dr. Denton Roon, who's the acting dean, Dr. Newton Cleghorn, Dr. Henry, uh, Dr. Emmanuel Paul, Dr. Vassal Kerr, and several of those who are currently there now. I did follow the protocols and sent them um, the manuscript to, over, to review to see if I have correctly represented um, the Adventist position as well as if my exegesis is sound etc so before um the book is published and as i said neither of them have responded except for one adventist professor in the united states who um asked to remain anonymous so that he would not be witch hunted you know adventism has a history of witch hunting people who disagree with their their teachings and who who uphold uh you know what script teaches on on these kind of things so he asked for his name to be um withdrawn you know to remain anonymous but i can read you what he said um he endorsed the book he says the author's exegesis is sound 
He has also been accurate and fair in describing the Adventist positions and thought. I highly recommend this book to Adventist ministers and to the church at large. So having read my book, this was his endorsement and conclusion. My exegesis is sound. I've correctly represented the Adventist position and he recommends it for the Adventist uh, population. But like I said, those here in Jamaica, they have not even sent me back an email to say noted or they, they got it or nothing of that sort. So when they are you know, telling you things and they are not aware of these issues and arguments, that, that's very suspect. That's very suspect. And Dr. Clegon is actually doing a crusade now uh, somewhere in Kingston and you know he's raising keen you know about these issues but you, you see the way a lot of these these gentlemen work is that uh, when you're in a in a um, captured audience everybody believes the same thing and they already have you know the same information you merely preach what they want to hear to reinforce what they already believe you're not giving them anything new so despite that I've issued a call on religious hard talk to respond to my presentation Despite Dr. Baldwin has done the same, and several others, the intelligentsia of the church will not respond. They know they cannot respond. As a matter of fact, before I left, I had, I had a, a good meeting with all of them there. And they could not defend any position of the Adventist church to me, their student. Because they know I'm not an idiot and I was one of their, one of their best students up there, right? So they know from a scholarly standpoint, these things are indefensible. But they wait till they get on their platform. And if you notice, you know, in their churches, uh, their arena, they make a whole lot of noise because there's no one to respond to them. And then they would, you know, give a gimmick like uh, they're going to give away their wives and all their houses. I heard uh, Glenn Samuels is a popular trademark of his where he'll say, you know, um, if anybody can show him why he should not keep the Sabbath or why he should keep any other day, um, he'll, as the president of West Jamaica, he'll lock down the churches and he would... Uh, he would, um, you know, give them the keys to the churches. And of course, they do this to, to deceive the masses. You know, they are in their environment. They are in their silo. Everybody believes the same thing. They control the audience. They control what is pushed out there. So, and they know no one is going to come with a different view. And if, if somebody were to come, they're going to just send a couple of our deacons whoever, and, and, and pry them off stage or pry them from, from the arena. So in their environment to reinforce and to make people think that they are true and right, they do and say these things and make these outlandish statements. But when they are called on a neutral platform where people from other faiths, you know, other Bible scholars, come, let's get together and let, 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 let's put the issue to rest and let's, let's debate, have official debates about these things, they will not show up. So those of you who will be listening, you, you need to understand how these people work. They will not show up. So in their environment, they'll make a lot of noise. They will go, go on badly. But when they are challenged to make an official response or to have an official debate in a neutral environment, they will not do anything. They save all the noise and all the flair for their environment where they are unchallenged. So I have followed the protocol and I have sent them uh, the rough draft of this to make a requisite response if they're able but so far there has been absolutely nothing and having been in there in, in that arena having had several meetings with them and their inability to respond to my pressing questions regarding Adventism before I left as a matter of fact that's why I left they could not prove to me from scripture while I was at school that Adventism was right and so I had no choice but to leave. They were just trying to bribe me to know to preach what the church teach. I'm a very bright young man and I can do so much for the church. But I, I'm, I'm not into that. I'm into the truth and the facts. And I will show you this evening why, uh, having gotten a grips and hands on experience of um, scholarly material and how to read and, and, and exegete scripture, that I, I, I have discarded um, Adventism and more so their stance on the Sabbath. So tonight I will prove to you why uh, mandatory Sabbatarianism is destroyed in New Testament faith. So Romans 14 um, is, is, is where I'm going to um, first and foremost start with. In verses 5 and 6, uh, the, the passage reads, One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. 
the one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. Now, the Sabbatarian arguments are, you know, Ian Boyne, Adventism, and several others, that this passage, you know, these two verses are not talking about the Sabbath. Uh, they are talking about feast days that were an issue between uh, Christians, you know, in Rome in the first century, etc. And so this do not uh, jeopardize Sabbath keeping in any way. But when you analyze this um, within context, beloved, that is far from the reality. This passage here, these two verses are talking about the festivals of Israel and the Sabbath. Let me prove it contextually. The context of this pericope, and a pericope is um, a section of text that forms a coherent context. So the context of this pericope is um, actually Romans chapter 13, verse 8 to chapter 15, verse 13. So the entire context we're looking at here is from chapter 13, verse 8, straight into chapter uh, 15, verse 13. And this pericope now is a discussion about the Jewish law and how Jews and Gentile Christians should coexist and relate to each other regarding their differences with regards to the Jewish dietary laws and the festivals of Israel. That's basically an overview of what this pericope is from chapter 13, verse 8 to chapter 15, verse 13. Uh, Jewish dietary laws and Sabbath observance applied to Jews and not to Gentiles. I had sufficiently proven this from um, the previous six studies on this. This now caused a drift or a rift rather in uh, Jewish and Gentile relations in the Church of Rome. Sabbatarians try to deflect the clear implications of this passage by claiming that this is talking about days of fasting uh, that are spoken about in, in um, the uh, first century literature, the Dadaki chapter 8 verse 1 which states, But as for your fast, let them not be with the hypocrites, for they fast on the second and fifth day of the week, but you are to fast on the fourth and on the preparation day. So they use this now as proof that Romans 14 is talking about fast days and that is not talking about the Sabbath day and the festivals of Israel but again as I just said he this here is not talking about the Dedak and you'll see and, and, and that is because the book of Romans predates the Dedaki by more than three decades Romans was written in the mid 50s AD so from uh, 50 to 56 is uh, where almost all New Testament scholars are agree and in uh, um, unanimously um, regarding the dating of the book of Romans. So it's a pre-AD 60s book of the New Testament, whereas the Dadaki is dated late in the first century to early second century. So for example, the Dadaki is dated, the earliest is 70, and that's a very, very um, um, unreasonable dating, but just to show you, the, the, the Dadaki, the earliest is uh, 70, but the majority of opinion is based on the content and when it was discovered in the 4th century, is from AD, um, from AD 880 to about 140. That is the dating for the Dadaki. Whereas for the Book of Romans, it's in the mid-50s. Therefore, uh, the fast days of the Dadaki are anachronistic with Romans 14, which means is that they don't fit in the same time frame. And so the statement of fast days in the Dadaki cannot be read backwards into Romans chapter 14 because Romans 14 was dealing with an issue that predated the Dadaki uh, fast day issue. And the author that was foreign to, to Paul where um, fast days are concerned. And I have proven in my book extensively um, where um, the three related Greek words, nestis, nestio, and nestia, that are used for fasting in the New Testament, they are never um, related to days of fasting in terms of um, a conflict, nor is there um, a recommendation on which day to fast and how to fast, etc. Nor do we see any kind of issues or what with um, uh, the Christian church, you know, all of the Christian churches that were written to regarding days of fasting. So the days of fasting in the Dadaki is a later development in the, in the Christian church. It is not what Romans chapter 14 is talking about. So that's the first reason. And the second reason is that the entire book of Romans never discusses fasting and fasting is foreign to the context of chapter 14. 
So that's the other reason. The entire book of Romans is dealing with the Jewish law and how we are saved. It never uses uh, any of the Greek words nestus, nestia, and nestuo, fasting. Uh, not, never uses it in the entire book, nor in chapter 14 for that matter. So fasting is never discussed there. Therefore, we cannot read that into Romans chapter 14 and say Paul is talking about fasting. The book of Romans and the pericope that I'm discussing is uh, describing or discussing issues of the Mosaic law. So these two arguments are airtight that this cannot be talking about fasting or those issues in the Christian church. After surveying the fast days versus holy days of our scholarly opinion in regard to um, Romans chapter 14, D.R. De Lacy concluded and I quote, the balance of probability then is in favor of the Sabbath being included in the days of Romans 14 verse 5. Paul allows that the keeping of such days is purely a matter of individual conscience. And this comes from, uh, from Sabbath to Lord's Day, page 182. And I already um, had advertised these books that these are the most authoritative books on Sabbatarianism and I have all of them and I have read all of them where they handle Sabbatarianism from every angle to every uh, denomination and church that holds to Sabbatarianism you know and the arguments they proffer regarding Sabbatarianism and uh, um, D.R. De Lacy you know from Sabbath to Lord's Day uh, the book there is one of the most authoritative books on Sabbatarianism and of course I had spoken about um, Dr. Baldwin's book his few books I have them uh, Dale Ratzlaff H.M. Uh, Riggle and of course my book which Do Dr. Baldwin's opinion and that of Kerry Wynn uh, very thorough and Larry Dean um, Sabbatarian researchers this here they have found to be the most powerful anti-Sabbatarian book within a hundred pages so get it and check out for yourselves and with, with the evidences and the arguments for yourselves. So right there conclusively, the Lacey says, the Sabbath is included in Romans chapter 14. Sabbatarians argue that the Sabbath is not in view here because the Greek word Sabbaton is not used in this passage, you know, and other words such as worship, sacred day, holy day, etc. is not being addressed. But this is a weak semantic argument as the Sabbath was esteemed above the other days by the Jews. It was to be observed, Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 to 11, Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 15, and also the Sabbath was certainly a day, Leviticus chapter 23 verse 3. Also keep in mind, as I said, I already established that Paul is talking about the Mosaic law in this pericope. Chapter 13, verse 8 to chapter 15, verse 13. The Mosaic law and the entirety of Old Testament scriptures. Read them when you get the chance and you will see this for yourselves. That this is what he's discussing. And in chapter 14, he zooms in on two divisive issues between Jews and Gentiles, which was um, the Judaic dietary laws, as well as the Sabbath and the festivals of Israel. And his position is, uh, all foods are clean, and I'll deal with um, that in a different lecture. Eat whatever you want, you know, and don't make each other to stumble by what you're eating. And whichever day you choose to keep, it's based on individual conviction. So, um, Paul here, writing to Jews who naturally worship together, therefore, uh, he don't need to mention worship. They already worship together. He don't need to have, a, you know, sacred day worship. They all would know what he's talking about. Let me also uh, state, um, give you a quote from my book too that proves that Romans 14 is talking about the Sabbath. Analyzing, from, analyzing a few points from the Greek sentence also lends support uh, to this understanding and conclusion. The first part of Romans 14 verse 5 reads in the Greek, Hos men krine himeran pa himeran, hos de krine pasan himeran. The anathros, that is indefinite noun, himiran for day, refers to any day that was esteemed or could be esteemed against another day. Surely the Sabbath fits into this category as it was set against and esteemed above other days in the Old Testament and within Judaism in the New Testament. In the second clause, the adjective all, pasan, that modifies the noun day, himiran, is contextually all-inclusive. You need to listen carefully now. The definition of this word, pasan or pas, you know the Greek, 
includes without exception all of whatever it is that is being modified. So for example, all the boys, two years old and young in Bethlehem, were killed by Herod, Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. All who are weary and burdened can come to Jesus for rest, Matthew 11, verse 28. Jesus will come with all his holy angels, Matthew 25, 31. Jesus possesses all power in heaven and earth, Matthew 28, 18. All nations will be evangelized with the gospel, Matthew 28, 19. All who believe in Jesus will not perish but have everlasting life, John 3, 16. Jesus' name is above all names, Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. The redeemed people of God will be from all nations, tribes, peoples, and languages, Revelation 7, verse 9. God will make all things new at the end of time, Revelation 21, verse 5, etc. So the all days here of Romans chapter 14, verse 5, that are to be esteemed alike include feast days, fast days, the Sabbath day, birthdays, national holidays, quote unquote pagan days, anniversary days, special days, whatever kind of days it is. As long as it is a day, it is included in the category of all days. So the Sabbath fits into both categories, whether to be regarded as better than other days or whether to be regarded as all days. And the powerful and unequivocal injunction that Paul gives to either party that holds either conviction is this. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Paul was a scholar par excellence. Galatians chapter 1 14 tells us that he advanced in his uh, you know, religion above all his contemporaries. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 15 and 16 tells us that Paul, uh, you know, he, he was given a lot of wisdom by God to the point that when he wrote to the church about um, the second coming of Christ and the, those events, uh, many who are unstable and unrest in the scriptures uh, twist his things to their own destruction. So he was a scholar par excellence. He knew the thrust and nuances of the Greek language and he most certainly knew that how this statement would have been understood by his learned audience. But yet he was forthright in his exhortation and, and conclusion. It's profound to note too that Paul does not condemn the one who regards all days alike knowing that the Sabbath would be included and, and, and uh, regarded within those days. What does Paul say? Paul says uh, he, he does not condemn the one who regard one day above another. He does not uh, tell the one who regards all these alike to straighten up and to regard the Sabbath as above others. Instead, he maintains that the observance of days is a personal matter that is done in honor of the Lord. Romans 14 verse 6. Therefore, the one who observes the Sabbath or any particular day does so in honor of the Lord. And the one who observes all days alike, that is... He or she has no conviction to keep the Sabbath or any other day as they are regarded with the same degree in his mind whether uh, they are seen as secular and non-binding or all of them are seen as holy because he is holy to God and they are fulfilled in Christ. Paul says, whichever position you hold regarding days, it's a matter of personal conviction that one does so in honor of the Lord. You can see pages 69 and 70 of my book where you will find that statement and uh, um, thorough analysis. So that settles it, uh, settles it for Romans chapter 14. So clearly the Sabbath here is presented as a matter of personal individual conviction. New Covenant believers are not bound to specific holy days. Days are inconsequential to our salvation and New Covenant faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the position of Romans chapter 14. And now we will turn to Colossians chapter 2 to, to analyze if the Sabbath is what is being spoken about. And the pericope of uh, Colossians chapter 2 is uh, verses 8 to verse 13 where I'll analyze and give you some facts that no honest Bible scholar will be able to contravene. Colossians chapter 2 verses 16 and 17 says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. The three basic arguments, well, rather four, of um, Sabbatarians on this text are as follows. Firstly, they said, this is not talking about the Mosaic Law, uh, Bakioki, Dr. Desmond Ford, Adventism, uh, Hebrew Roots Movement, Armstrongites, 
uh, Church of God International, Ian Boyne, you know, the most vocal Sabbatarian here in Jamaica on this. They maintain that this is not talking about the Mosaic Law to deflect the Sabbath here. And as of late, I think Ian Bond has been, you know, changing his position a bit that, you know, it is talking about the Sabbath, but he, he uh, you know, twists it to refer to, you know, it's affirming, but we're going to deal with, with that argument. The second argument is that this is not talking about the weekly Sabbath, but the ceremonial Sabbath because it mentions food and drink, which were offered on the Sabbaths and not on the weekly Sabbath. So this is the second argument. The mention of food and drink excludes the weekly Sabbath, you know, because food and drink weren't offered on it. It's talking about the other uh, festivals of Israel. The third argument is that the Greek uses the plural form sabbaton, the genitive plural. Therefore, it is referring to the yearly Sabbath and not the weekly. That's the third argument. And the fourth argument that's used is um, this one. This here passage in Colossians 2 is condemning Gnosticism and it's affirming the festivals of Israel. So whereas anti-Sabbatarians say that it is negating them, they say it's affirming them. So they see it as, you know, as Paul encouraging the Colossians to not let anybody judge them for keeping these festivals of Israel and, you know, dietary restrictions and things like that. But there are a lot of problems with that. And let me demonstrate now that exegetically none of these arguments can stand. Firstly, the first argument that this is not talking about the Mosaic Law is ruled out immediately. Even though the customary Greek word for the Mosaic Law, nomos, and the Mosaic Law here, beloved, is not just a ceremonial law as Adventism like to claim. The Mosaic Law is the entire first five books of Moses, which includes the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments weren't excluded outside of the Mosaic Law. As a matter of fact, there's no difference in Scripture regarding the Law of God and the Law of Moses. God gave the Law to Moses. Moses gave God's Law to the people. That's what it is. And you read the book of Nehemiah, you see this uh, proficiently. You read my book, I justify this sufficiently. Uh, a quick example, uh, in Luke chapter 2, when Jesus uh, was eight days old and he was going to be circumcised. And the Bible says, um, they brought him to the temple. He was circumcised according to the custom of Moses. And it switches according to the law of the Lord and they offered the requisite sacrifice. If you read Mark chapter 7 verses 9 and 10, where Jesus rebukes the Pharisees and says, um, you make void the commandment of God by your tradition. And then Jesus quotes a, a, a commandment. For Moses says, honor your father and your mother. Now, again, this, this destroys the Sabbatarian argument and the Adventist argument that uh, the Ten Commandments aren't called the law of Moses. Because Jesus himself says in Mark chapter 7 verse 10, that it was Moses who says, honor your father and your mother. Lo and behold, when we read Exodus chapter 20, we see it's God who said, honor your father and your mother. So there was no differentiation in the minds of Jews that this is Moses' law and this is God's law. And so we could throw away Moses' law and obey God's law. No, it was one and the same thing. And, I, and like I said, I have sufficiently proven this in my book. And Jews never held uh, such a conviction. So even though the customary Greek word nomos for the Mosaic law is not used in this passage, nor in the entire book of Colossians for that matter, key terms and references tell us that it is referring to the Mosaic law. Terms such as circumcision and uncircumcision in verses uh, 11 and 13. You can cross references with Genesis chapter 17, verses 9 to 14, Exodus chapter 12, verses 43 to 49, Leviticus chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, Ezekiel chapter 44, verses 5 to 9, Acts chapter 15, verses 1 and 5, and Galatians chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. The Mosaic law dealt with circumcision and uncircumcision. Another term, sins and references. The Mosaic law identified and dealt with sins and references. That's also in verse 11 and 13 of... Um, Colossians 2, and you can look at Romans uh, chapter 4, verses 13 to 15, chapter 5, 19 to 20, Galatians chapter 3, verses 17 to 24, where the Mosaic law deals with sins and uh, trespasses. The mention of food, drink, festival, new moon, and Sabbath in verse 16, you can look at Numbers 28 and 29, where the Mosaic law deals with food, drink, festival, new moon, and Sabbath. Uh, dietary restrictions in verses 16, 21 to 23 of Colossians 2, you can cross references with uh, Leviticus chapter 11, Numbers chapter 6, and Deuteronomy chapter 14, where the Mosaic law deals with dietary restrictions for the Jews and the Nazarites, etc. Also, 
the phrase in Colossians uh, 2 16 and 17 a shadow of things to come as a matter of fact a shadow of things to come is a similar statement we read in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 concerning the Mosaic law which says the law has but a shadow of the good things to come so when it says um, these things are a shadow of things to come it's referring to the Mosaic law that also was a shadow of things to come and uh, and, and uh, as a matter of fact uh, this um, statement here, this last statement is profound because it is a reference to Christ, where verse 17 says, and the substance is Christ. This last reference echoes John chapter 5, verses 39 to 40, where Jesus said that the Mosaic law testified about him and that he is its substance. This same concept also services in Luke chapter 24, verses 25 to 27, and Luke 44, verses 4, uh, Luke uh, 24, verses 44 to 47. So with all of these things in mind, we can see that the abrogation of the um, law of Moses is indicated by the content of Colossians chapter 2. So despite the fact that the customary Greek word nomos that is used for the Mosaic law throughout the New Testament is not used in Colossians 2, the items that are mentioned clearly reveal to us that it is talking about the Mosaic law as these items are Judaic, these items are resident in the Mosaic law. So that first argument is dead. The second argument that contends that food and drinks were offered on all the other Sabbaths and not the weekly uh, is not based on the scriptural facts. It is based on some wild assumption and ignorance at best. Throughout Judaism, and you're gonna see right now, food and drinks were offered on all the Sabbaths of Israel and the weekly Sabbath required even more food and drink offerings. So in Numbers chapter 28 verses 9 and 10 we read, on the Sabbath day, the weekly Sabbath, two lambs a year old without blemish were to be offered, two tenths of an ephah of fine flour for a grain offering, mixed with oil and its drink offering. This is the burnt offering for every Sabbath, besides the regular burnt and drink offerings. So right there this theory and this argument falls down flat. The Sabbath offerings were much more than the regular weekly offerings. Food and drink were offered on the weekly Sabbath. We also read in 1 Chronicles chapter 23, verse, 28, uh, verse 29, it says, speaking of the priests and the Levites, their duty was also to assist the, with the shoe bread, the flour for grain offering, the wafers of lev unleavened bread, the bake offering, the offering mixed with oil, and all the measures of quanti size, uh, quantity or size. And they were to stand every morning thanking and praising the Lord, and likewise at evening, and whenever burnt offerings were offered to the Lord on the Sabbaths, the weekly, new moons, monthly, and the feast of Israel yearly, according to the number required of them regularly before the Lord. Again, we're seeing this clearly. We also see in 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 4, where it says, Behold, Solomon speaking, I'm about to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, and to dedicate it to him for the burning of incense, sweet spices before him, for the regular arrangement of the shewbread, burnt offerings morning and evening, daily, on the Sabbaths, weekly, the new moons, monthly, and the appointed feast of the Lord, yearly, as ordained forever for Israel. We also read in 2 Chronicles chapter 31, verses uh, 2 to uh, 3, where the Bible says, And Hezekiah appointed the divisions of the priests and the Levites, division by division, each according to his service, the priests, the Levites, for burnt offerings, peace offerings, to minister in the gates of the camp of the Lord, and to give thanks and praise him. The contribution of the kings for his own possessions was for the burnt offerings, the burnt offerings of the morning and evening, daily, the burnt offerings for the Sabbaths, weekly, the new moons, monthly, and the appointed feast, yearly, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Notice these mosaic matters, it said, it is to be in the law of the Lord. Showing you again, there's no difference between God's law and Moses' law. It's one and the same law that has different names. We also read in Nehemiah chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, we also take on ourselves the obligation to give a yearly uh, third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our God, for the shoe bread, the regular grain offering, the regular burnt offering, the Sabbaths, the new moons, the appointed feasts, the holy things, the sins offerings, and all the things of Israel. Again, we see the consistent pattern. 
Ezekiel chapter 45, verse uh, 17, we also read, It should be the prince's duty to furnish the burnt offerings, grain offerings, drink offerings, at the feasts, yearly, the new moons, monthly, and the Sabbaths, weekly, all the appointed feasts of the house of Israel. He shall provide the sin offerings, grain offerings, burnt offerings, and peace offerings to make atonement for the house of Israel. So clearly, again, we see in a consistent pattern and train, um, uh, 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 um, thought and teaching regarding the food and drink requirements for all the Sabbaths of Israel, including the weekly. We also read in Ezekiel 46, verse 1 and uh, to verse 5, Thus says the Lord, the gate of the inner court that faces east shall be shut on the six working days, but on the Sabbath day, the weekly Sabbath, it shall be opened. On the day of the new moon, it shall be opened. The people of the land shall bow down at the entrance of the gate before the Lord on the Sabbaths, weekly, and the new moons, monthly. The burnt offering that the prince offers to the Lord on the Sabbath shall be six lambs without blemish, and a ram without blemish, and the grain offering with the ram shall be an ephah, and the grain offering of the lamb shall be as much as he is able together with the hen of oil to each ephah. So right there we are seeing a consistent testimony in scripture that food and drink offerings were required on all the Sabbaths. And the weekly Sabbath was so special it required even more offerings. That's how elevated and superb it was. It required much more offerings than on all the other Sabbaths. So we see clearly, beloved, that the second argument that contends that this is talking exclusively about the yearly Sabbaths and not the weekly Sabbath because of the food and drink our statement in Colossians 2 falls down flat. It's ignorance at best. Throughout the Old Testament, throughout Judaism, the weekly Sabbath was no different from the yearly Sabbaths in the burnt offerings, drink offerings, food offerings, etc. The third argument that contends that um, uh, uh, Sabbaton there um, is referring to the yearly Sabbaths, again, linguistically falls down flat. Now, for those of you who would have interacted with me and those of you who I went to school with, you would know when it comes to the Greek, I take that serious. You know, it's very easy for me and I love the Greek. Now, I will prove, beloved friends, that Sabbaton in both Old Testament and New Testament always refer to the weekly Sabbath. Follow me now. Follow me closely. These are exegetical and linguistical facts that no honest Bible scholar cannot, by any stretch of the imagination, circumvent or seek to reinterpret. And like I said to you, this is why Adventist scholars and professors who, like myself, are educated in the Greek language, biblical hermeneutics, and uh, um, Hebrew studies and Israelite studies will not face anyone on a neutral public platform or debate. They are not idiots. They don't want to be uh, look like idiots. So they keep their teaching for their own captured audience. People who already believe the same things. So the, the scholars don't make no attempt to defend Adventism properly with other scholars and people like me who challenges it. They leave it to the ignorant but arrogant laymen like, like um, Derek Gillespie, Winston Gillen, uh, Alexander Leckie and those others who are headstrong in their thing and they have no clue of New Testament Greek. They can't even tell you the first from, 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 from the last letter of the Greek alphabet perhaps. They know nothing of hermeneutics. The only thing they have is just their wild proof text then, which is an outmoded, outdated and erroneous method of scriptural interpretation and they're on people's back like white on rice and they are headstrong in their thing. But the educated pastors and scholars like myself they would never, and I repeat, never take up any challenge to debate anyone like myself or Andy Sabatarian who disagrees with their thing, nor would they come and publicly defend Adventism hermeneutically, lexically, theologically, uh, uh, exegetically to a neutral platform. They won't. Like I said, when they're in their 10 crusades, in their churches, in their TV networks, on their own platform, where they control the, the debate, the argument, they control, you know, and filter the information, etc. They make a lot of noise. But when they are challenged to face a neutral platform in a proper study 
and debate on the matter, they won't. And that is why, uh, despite that, you know, I disagree with Ian Boyne's position, I have to respect him because he is vocal about his uh, disagreement and his, you know, position on Sabbatarianism and he's willing to defend it with those who disagree. Whereas Adventists, they make a bug of noise, as we say here in Jamaica, but the leaders will not, you know, come out in, a, in an official debate on a neutral platform to say, well, here's our exegetical response to these things. And like I said, my book is a thorough refutation of Adventism on the diet issue as well as mandatory Sabbatarianism. They are dead regarding this. And I assume many of them will deliberately stay away from reading this book because they will be challenged to change their positions if they read this book. But for you who want to know the truths and the facts, get my book. All foods are clean and every day is the Sabbath and it's a direct response to Dr. Bakiyoki, the prominent Adventist um, professor who is now dead and the entire Seventh-day Adventist church. So get it to them and challenge them to offer a thorough reputation of, of my book. And it's just 105 pages. That is nothing to read. I read this, I can read this in less than an hour. I sit down and read this in one sitting. So it ain't nothing at all. Go through it and, and look at um, the arguments for yourselves and see why their position can't stand and they know it. So um, here's the thing now regarding Sabaton. The Greek word Sabaton, which means the Sabbath, never refers to the other Sabbaths in the New Testament. The other Sabbaths of Israel are always called by their name, or they're alluded to by their name, by how they are reinterpreted in Christ, or by how they are fulfilled in the New Testament. So for example, the new moon is called by its name, Colossians 2.16, the new moon. Passover is called by its name, Matthew 26, verse 2 and verse 17, Acts chapter 12, verse 4, John 18, 18, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Hebrews 11, 28, etc. They are always called by their name. They are never called Sabbaton in the New Testament. Uh, the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, Acts chapter, 5, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, Acts chapter 20, verse 16, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 8. All is called by name. The Feast of Trumpets, Matthew 24, verse 31, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, Revelation chapter 8 and 9. Unleavened Bread, Matthew 16, verses 6 to 12. Also Matthew 26, verse 17. Mark chapter 14, verse 1 and 12. Acts chapter 12, verse 13. Chapter, uh, Acts chapter 12, verse 3 rather. And chapter 20, verse 6. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 to 8. And Galatians chapter 5, verse 9. The Day of Atonement another feast of Israel, all is called by name. Matthew 27, verse 51, Mark chapter 15, 38, Luke 23, 45, Romans chapter 3, verses 25 and 26, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 7 to 10. The Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Boots, or in gathering. John chapter 7, verses 2 to 10, John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 4, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, John chapter 1 verse 14, Revelation 21 verses 3 to 5, the Feast of First Fruits, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 20 to 23, uh, chapter 16 verse 15, Romans chapter 8 verse 23, Romans 16 verse 5, James 1 verse 8, and the Feast of Dedication or Hanukkah, which was not an Old Testament feast, but the Jews began, well, instituted and celebrate Hanukkah even to this day in commemoration of the cleansing of their temple in uh, one in the first cent second century uh, BC, uh, fulfilling the prophecy of Daniel chapter 8, where Antiochus defiled the temple, uh, Ju Judas Maccabeus and his brothers, they rededicated the temple, they cleansed it from uh, the defilements that Antiochus had um, done to it uh, by sacrificing the pig and destroying it, etc. And they instituted the Feast of Hanukkah, or the Feast of Dedication, uh, in commemoration of that. And you can read about this in John chapter 10, verses 22 to 23, where Jesus himself honors uh, the Feast of Dedication. So, Sabbaton never refers to the other feasts and the other Sabbaths in the New Testament. Sabbaton exclusively refers to the weekly Sabbath. Sabbaton is used 68 times in the New Testament. It always means the weekly Sabbath, whether it is used in the singular or plural form in the Greek, with or without the definite article in every declining form. So 
in the Greek, you know, the Greek has um um the declensions. There's first declension, which is the feminine declension. There's the second declension, which is the masculine declension, and there's the, the um third declension, which is um can it either be feminine or masculine as well as neuter. So Greek nouns, you know, and words they have declensions. So they are masculine, you know, like coanthropos. The man is masculine. Uh, you are here. Delphi would be uh, the sister is a feminine declension, and uh, to sabaton, which uh, would, would be neuter, and it's the Sabbath. So it's used 68 times in the New Testament, whether it's singular or plural, in any declension, uh, with any um, declension, declining form. For example, you have um, the nominative case, genitive ablative, uh, dative locative instrumental. Accusative and vocative, whether in singular or plural, it always means the weekly Sabbath. And the genitive plural form here in Colossians chapter 2 always also means the weekly Sabbath in the New Testament. So, for example, when you read Matthew 28, verse 1, where it says, um, On the first day of the week, Jesus rose from the dead, the Greek is miaton sabbaton, first day after the Sabbath. As a matter of fact, uh, the weekly Sabbath determined how the other days were named. It was the chief day of the Jews, and it's the chief day that all the other days surround. So miaton sabbaton, first day after the Sabbath. Deuteras sabbaton, second day after the Sabbath. Trite sabbaton, uh, third day after the Sabbath. Uh, tetate sabbaton, fourth day after the Sabbath. Pemte sabbaton, fifth day after the Sabbath. And, and Hecte sabbaton, sixth day after the Sabbath, uh, was also called pro sabbaton, which means the day before the Sabbath. And paraskue, preparation for the Sabbath, the day in which we prepare for the Sabbath. So sabbaton always means the weekly Sabbath. You can look this up in Matthew 28, verse 1, Mark chapter 16, verse 2, Luke chapter 4, verse 16, and of course in the Greek there. I'm talking about uh, Luke 24 verse 1 John chapter 20 verse 1 John 20 verse 19 Acts chapter 13 verse 14 Acts chapter 16 verse 13 Acts chapter 20 verse 7 and 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 2 so Sabbaton the genitive plural always refer to the weekly Sabbath in the New Testament and also in the Septuagint the Septuagint now is um the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. So even in the Old Testament, Sabbaton always mean the weekly Sabbath in any declining form. And this is something that I've proven beyond the shadow of a doubt in my book. Let me read you a few uh, scriptural passages in the Old Testament where Sabbaton, the genitive plural, is used just as how it's used in Colossians chapter 2 verse 16. Here's a killer passage. Exodus chapter 20 verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Greek there is nemeste tehemeraton sabaton hagiadzen oten. Remember the day of the Sabbath to keep it holy. Sabaton, the genitive plural there, is referring to the weekly Sabbath. Also in Deuter, uh, Exodus chapter 35 verse 3 reads, You shall kindle no fire in all your dwelling places on the Sabbath day. The Greek there is tehemeraton sabaton. We also read in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 12 and verse 15, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. The Greek there is, Tehemera ton sabaton, the Sabbath day. Verse 15, Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Again the Greek, Tehemera ton sabaton, just as we have in Colossians chapter 2, 16. Also, you can also see these other passages because of time, I can't read them all. But you are uh, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 15. Sabbaton is used for the Sabbath. Uh, Leviticus 24, verse 8. Numbers chapter 28, verses 9 and 10. Second Kings chapter 16, verse 18. 2 Chronicles 31, verse 3. Nehemiah chapter 10, 33. Isaiah 58, verse 13. Jeremiah 17, verses 21 to 27. Ezekiel 22, verse 26. Ezekiel 46, verses 1, 4, and 12. Sabaton, genitive plural, is used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and it always referred to the weekly Sabbath. Here's some more evidence. Every time the Old Testament links the new moon celebration with the Sabbath, as in Colossians 2.16, the weekly Sabbath is what's always referred to. 
You can see this in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 23, 1 Chronicles 23, verse 31, 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 4, chapter 8, verse 13, Nehemiah 10, 33, Isaiah 1, 13, Isaiah 66, 23, Ezekiel chapter 45, 17, 46, verse 1, Hosea 2, 11, and Amos chapter 8, verse 5. So just like how Colossians 2 here says, festival, new moon, and Sabbath, Every time the new moon celebration is mentioned with the Sabbath, it's talking about the weekly Sabbath. This is a consistent trend throughout Jewish history. The sentence structure of this text, Colossians chapter 2, 16, festival, new moon, or Sabbath, is a phrase used in the Old Testament to imply the three aspects of Jewish festival structure and designates the order of annual, monthly and weekly festivals. This annual, monthly and weekly sequence appears five times in the Old Testament, both in ascending and descending order. For instance, 2 Chronicles chapter 2 verse 4, 31 verse 3, Nehemiah 10 33, Ezekiel 45 17 and Hosea 2 11. All through the history of the Israelites there existed a consistent chain of annual Sabbaths, monthly new moon celebrations and weekly Sabbaths. If the word Sabbath as used here in Colossians 2.16 means yearly Sabbaths, the sentence would have read annual Sabbaths, monthly Sabbaths, and annual Sabbaths. This clearly would not make any sense because festival already encapsulates all the annual Sabbaths and also the three-part Hebrew convention of referring to the appointed festivals as a three-part set, listing them according to how they appear on their schedule as once a year, once a month, and every week would be structurally and conventionally, conventionally violated. So right there, beloved, linguistically, historically, hermeneutically, Sabbaton is referring to the weekly Sabbath in Colossians chapter 2, 16. And Paul says here clearly, no one should judge any New Testament believer with regards to whether they keep it or whether they don't keep it. So that argument that Sabbaton, the genitive plural, refers to the yearly Sabbaths, it bears no kind of linguistic and hermeneutical uh, facts or foundation whatsoever. And like I said, like I said, if you disagree, if you disagree, pull out your Old Testament Greek and your New Testament Greek and present the exegetical and linguistic evidence that says otherwise. So the argument that is not talking about the weekly Sabbath, it's absurdity, it falls down flat, it can't stand on four legs, much less, much less on two legs, and it can't hold one ounce of water. The linguistic and hermeneutical evidence stands airtight. The weekly Sabbath is what Colossians chapter 2 is talking about when it says Sabbaton. So the, the, the yearly festivals, the monthly festivals, and the weekly Sabbath, Paul says, no one should judge you on these Judaic holy days. They are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. And the things to come there, the Greek there, Esten, is written in the present, but this is what we call, as our Greek gramma grammarians, a historical present which means uh, the author writes a historical fact in the present to give the present reader a feel of palpability as if it is happening now. For example, we observe the same thing in Romans chapter 5, verse uh, I think it's 12, when it speaks of Adam was a, a type of Christ who was to come. And again, what we find there, estin is the same Greek word, it's in the present tense. Now, Paul could not have been saying Adam was currently existent. Adam had dead for millennia. But he wrote it because Adam stood as a shadow of Christ, who had already come, Christ who had already come and was the second Adam, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So uh, that is why the New Testament, um, the, sorry, uh, the NIB, and the Weymouth New Testament correctly translate this uh, uh, verse here as a shadow of things that were to come, but the substance belonged to Christ. That is absolutely um, um, hermeneutically correct. So that argument is dead. Sabbaton refers to the weekly Sabbath. And the last argument, as I draw to a close, 
that says this passage is condemning Gnosticism and affirming the festivals of Israel, uh, it does not hold water. It does not bear under proper scrutiny. Here's why. Indeed, this passage is condemning Gnosticism. This is, uh, you see, Gnosticism is a very wide um, study and uh, various groups and practices in uh, the first to about the fourth century of the Christian church. There are various branches of Gnosticism. You know, you have the Greek, uh, the Stoics, uh, and, and various other um, Gnostic groups that arose in the Christian church. Colossians 2 here focuses on the Judaic form of Gnosticism. How do we know? Because of the Judaic elements that are mentioned and that are negated in the passage. So this passage here, Colossians 2 verses 8 to 23, is condemning Ju the Judaic form of Gnosticism as well as it is negating, not affirming, it's negating the dietary laws and the festivals of Israel. For example, a physical circumcision is negated because believers now have a spiritual circumcision and baptism in Christ. You see this in verses 11 and 12. Uh, the believer's record of debt is negated and cancelled as a result of being forgiven by God. Verses uh, 13 and 14. Food and drink regulations and the festivals of Israel are negated by having Christ as their reality. Verses 16 and 17. And asceticism, food taboos and regulations are negated because believers have been filled in Christ and they are dead to the elemental, elemental uh, spirits of the world. Verses 18 to 23, you can cross-reference it with verses 9 and 10. So what we see here in Colossians chapter 2 is not an affirmation of these Judaic elements. It is a negation of them. So Paul says, because believers have died with Christ, they have been raised with Christ, and they now stand filled and complete in him, the record of debt of sin has been cancelled out and removed. The Gnostic Judaic groups were judging him for, for um, not keeping these things as they should, etc. So Paul says, all of these things are negated. Uh, circumcision is negated. The food elements are negated. Uh, uh, the, the, the food taboos are negated. Angelic worship is negated. The festivals and Sabbaths and all of these visionary experiences, all of these things are negated because believers currently stand complete in Christ. They don't need to add anything to the gospel of Christ to be complete. As they are, they are filled, they are complete. The gospel is Jesus plus nothing. So Paul says you already have Jesus. You don't need food distinction. You don't need to keep holy days. You don't need to be fasting and engage in asceticism and visionary experiences and all of these different things. So far from affirming these dietary practices, uh, the Sabbaths and angelic worship and uh, visionary, visionary experiences, the context of the passage serves to negate these Judaic practices. So conclusively, beloved, as I come to a close, Romans chapter 14 and Colossians chapter 2 destroy mandatory Sabbath keeping and food rules for New Covenant believers. What you choose to eat is an individual, cultural, medical, personal matter. The days you choose to worship and keep is an individual a church and collective matter those issues are abolished for new covenant believers they are, are you cannot be judged by them god does not hold you accountable to them and these churches and groups and sects and cults that continue to promote these things as part and parcel with new covenant faith in christ and the gospel are rehashing the same judaizing heresy that Paul fought furiously in the first century. That's exactly what, you, what they're doing. When they're demanding that you abstain from certain foods and you keep certain festivals and the Sabbath as part and parcel of um, salvation in Christ and new covenant faith, they are rehashing the same Judaizing heresy 
that Paul and the early church stamped once and for all in Acts chapter 15, in the book of Romans, and in the book of Galatians, and throughout church history. So we're seeing here, beloved, clearly that their position is wrong. Their position in mandatory Sabbath keeping is wrong. And these two passages, as I exegetically and, and, and hermeneutically dealt with them, remove uh, these things for new covenant believers. And let me lastly give you uh, two... Let me give you two nuggets as I bring this to a close to further convince you that Sabbath keeping and these things are not salvific issues. Firstly, breaking or keeping the Sabbath is never called or considered uh, breaking or not keeping rather. Breaking or not keeping the Sabbath is never called or considered to be sin in the New Testament. In Mark chapter 7 verses 21 to 22, 13 sins are listed. Jesus does not mention breaking the Sabbath. In Romans chapter 1 verses 29 to 32, we have a list of 20 sins and not one of them is Sabbath breaking for which humanity is guilty. Uh, humanity is guilty before God. In Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 to 21, Paul lists 15 sins that will keep people who continuously practice them outside of the kingdom of God, but Sabbath breaking is not one of them. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 verses 9 to 10, he lists 11 sins, but Sabbath breaking is not mentioned. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 to 14, verses 1 to 4 rather, there's a list of 18 sins that will be prevalent in the last days, but not once is Sabbath breaking mentioned. In Revelation 21 verse 8, seven types of sin are listed. That will get one thrown into the lake of fire, but Sabbath breaking is not first on the list, neither is it even mentioned. In Revelation 22 verse 15, six types of sinners are seen outside of the New Jerusalem, but Sabbath breakers are not mentioned, nor they are even considered to be one of these individuals. So where sins are concerned, Sabbath breaking or not keeping the Sabbath is never considered sin in the New Testament. And these things are called sins that will, for all intents and purposes, keep one outside of the kingdom of God. But Paul or no New Testament writer ever considers Sabbath breaking to be sin. That's the first thing. And lastly, as I close now, lastly, Sabbath keeping is not a fruit of the Spirit, nor a godly virtue in the New Testament. In Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 to 23, we have nine fruit of the, fruit of the Spirit mentioned. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, etc. But Sabbath, break, Sabbath keeping is not one of them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we see where Paul expounds on the virtues of love. But Sabbath keeping is not among them. In 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 5 to 10, we see where he describes seven virtues of uh, the Christian faith and Sabbath keeping is not among them. So Sabbath breaking is never called a sin in the New Testament that's going to keep you outside of God's kingdom. Neither is it considered a virtue or a fruit of the spirit whereby that shows Christian maturity. And I leave you with this quote from Michael Morrison in his book, uh, Circumcision tithing on the Sabbath, which Old Testament laws apply to Christians. And here's what he says. The New Testament has space for all sorts of commands, from obvious things to subtle things, but it never commands the Sabbath. This would be odd if the Sabbath were an important command. I mean, Adventism and Ian Boyne and most of these other Sabbatarian groups see it as a, you know, part and parcel of salvation faith. The Adventism, for example, it's the final determinant of your salvation. Very soon, you know, worshiping on Sunday will be sinful and you're going to receive the mark of the beast and be locked out of God's kingdom. And worshiping on Saturday will be uh, the seal of God that will grant you entrance into God's kingdom. You know, that's what the theology is. But if this were true, how is it that Sabbath, the Sabbath is never seen as an important command in the New Testament? He continues... We find sweeping statements that make the Old Covenant law obsolete, but unlike other commands, we never find the Sabbath commanded again or made an exception to the rule. 
Paul and John say a lot about the godly behavior that springs from Christian faith and love, but the Sabbath is simply never commanded. Paul dealt with numerous sins and problems of Christian living. He listed numerous sins that characterize people who will not inherit the kingdom of God. I just gave you a lot of those lists, but he never mentioned Sabbath breaking. In describing um, uh, the sins of the Gentiles in Roman, Romans 1, he says nothing about the Sabbath. If the Sabbath is essential, it is certainly surprising that no one is ever criticized for ignoring it. In the first century Roman Empire, slaves would have found it particularly difficult to keep the Sabbath. Some of them had unconverted harsh taskmasters or, you know, slave masters. First Peter chapter 2 verse 18. Some parts of the Roman Empire didn't even use a seven-day week. They had an eight-day because slaves did not have to keep the Sabbath. For one thing, first century Jews did not believe that Gentiles had to keep the Sabbath. For another, the decision at Jerusalem recorded in Acts 15 was, was that converted spirit-led Gentiles were not required to become circumcised and keep the law of Moses nor the Sabbath. Little is said about the Sabbath because it was not a problem. Instead, the Sabbath was a neutral matter, neither commanded nor forbidden. People were free to rest on that day they choose or to use the day in other ways as long as they did what they did to the Lord or to one of the Lord. Romans chapter 14 verses 5 and 6. Likewise, the New Testament does not say that any other day ought to be a day of rest. Sunday is not the Sabbath or a day of rest either. You know, you keep anyone that you choose. None is mandated. There's no command to keep the first day either as a day of meeting or a day of rest. It is neither commanded nor forbidden. Christians are free to work these things out for themselves. Um, Christians are commanded to assemble together for worship, but we are not commanded when. Hebrews chapter 10, 25. The important thing is not which day we observe, but whether we have Jesus as our Lord and Savior. He is the test commandment, the center of faith, the standard by which we will be judged. He is our greatest need, and this comes from his book, Sabbath, Circumcision, and Tithing, which Old Testament laws apply to Christian, the fourth edition, page 173. So as I take my leave, beloved saints, Romans chapter 14 and Colossians chapter 2 destroy mandatory Sabbatarianism. You as a new covenant believer are free to keep Saturday as the Sabbath if you want, Sunday as the Sabbath if you want, or any other day. These things are non-salvific issues. You are left to work these things out for yourselves and God does not hold you accountable for any decision that you make. And herein is the end of the matter. And like I said, again, I make a call. I specifically call Adventism and the scholars out. And the pastors, if you disagree with my conclusion, I'll send you a free copy of my book to refute the arguments. Watch this presentation hermeneutically, linguistically, and exegetically refute the arguments. If you cannot do this, then it is clearly demonstrating that you are not being honest with the facts because you know you will have dire changes to make in your theology and the things that you are teaching the people or you're being a straight out coward that cannot stand up for the truth and the right though the heavens fall as your prophet says and you are a hireling you're teaching things for comfort you're teaching things you don't believe in and you know that can't stand proper exegesis historical uh, uh, artifact and truths because you want to live all right and you're guiding your pride and the things you were preaching over the years. So again, I challenge any Adventist minister, the laymen, they're a waste of time. Like I said, these guys just nye 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 like, you know, like, like mongrel dogs that you heal all day. And they are clueless of the biblical studies and facts and the arguments to exegetically present a decent argument. It's just a bunch of wild assumption and all of these 
crazy haphazard proof texting so I won't even bother to respond to them I call on the educated pastors and scholars like myself to face these arguments and let's trash out the issues and Ian Boy call them out too as a matter of fact he and I are preparing to do some official debates on this matter you know on religious hard talk as well as otherwise as we're able you know I'm hoping that uh, enough time will be provided for us to trash out these things we are in dialogue preparing to do official debates on this matter and I have to respect him that he's able to stand up and defend his position whereas the Adventist pastors and scholars who know these issues who can read Greek like me and who, who, who have the historical facts and the Judaic writings etc they, they stand behind the comforts of their little pulpits and tent meetings and they make a bag of noise like we say in Jamaica, they yap all day and just make noise and say all kind of things. But when they're called out, come on, religious heart talk and present uh, your arguments to, 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 to Jamaica and the world at large. Mums is the word, not a word from the official leadership. When they're called on a neutral official debate platform, present your arguments all now. They won't say a word. So, beloved friends. Weigh the facts, compare the arguments, and see for yourselves which position you will stand. But don't let these people and their loud mouth in cause you to believe otherwise. Their arguments can't hold water, and I have proven it beyond a shadow of a doubt. And so if any of them are willing to take up this challenge, they know where to find me. They know how to find me email address you name it they know how to find me and for those of you who join me tonight i thank you for your patience and for your understanding of, of, of um, these matters and allow me to flesh them out and to share this with you and i hope that you were tremendously blessed you got a good uh, 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 understanding of the arguments and you would have seen that romans 14 and colossians 2 exegetically destroys these things that these Judaizing heretics are trying to make salvific and part and parcel of New Testament faith. So thank you very much for joining me. Until next time when I should do another study. God bless you. Have a great evening. And I hope to answer your questions and queries as best as possible uh, as this study ends. Have a pleasant evening.